There's a blinding pain in your right calf. You've been bitten by a venomous snake. What do you do? You've got to suck out the venom. Snake bite. You got that tourniquet? Yeah. We need to slow the venom. Suck out the poison. We'll put a tourniquet on me. We have to suck out the poison. Chop it off. This scene plays out in countless movies, which offer a myriad of methods of saving your life. But will any of them prove helpful in such a dangerous situation? Let's find out. Suck it! I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Having caught the attention of your backpacking chums, they rush in your direction, just as you keel over. The most confident adventurer of the group proposes they should suck out the venom from a snake bite. We need to find the bite and suck out the venom! Ooh. Ooh. Most of us have probably heard about this approach, but let's be honest, you don't want to wait until you're actually bitten by a snake to decide whether or not it's actually a good idea. So let's cut to the chase. It's not. According to the John Hopkins School of Medicine, doing this will only introduce infection and cause more damage. Better suck the poison out then. If it were even possible to suck venom from the wound, oh, my tongue's all fucked. The sucker would then themselves be at risk of exposure through cuts or abrasions on their lips or gums. There are such things as venom suction tools available, but a 2004 study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine found that the use of such a device reduced the envenomation load by only 0.04%. Removing sizable quantities of bloody fluid, but removed virtually no mock venom used in the experiment. You politely decline the offer. Okay then. What about use a tourniquet for a venomous bite? Okay, we need to slow the venom. You can see the logic. If you can prevent blood flowing away from the bite, surely the venom won't be able to seep into the rest of your body. But does the science concur with this logic? Getting bitten by a venomous snake in the wild is bad. But being stuck in a job that slowly drains the life out of you can feel even worse. And, let's be honest, long hours, low pay and burnout feel like their own kind of venom. That's why today's video is sponsored by Triple Ten, an online bootcamp that teaches you real, future-proof tech professions so you can escape that toxic job cycle with the antidote of a career change. The best part? You don't need any tech background to start. Their programs are totally beginner-friendly flexible with your schedule, and designed so you can pivot into a career that AI can't replace. And what if you don't feel like coding? Take a look at design or AI automation courses. Triple Ten even offers a get a job or get your money back guarantee. And the results speak for themselves. 82% of grads get hired within six months with a median salary of $70,000. So if you're tired of feeling like your nine to five is a survival game you didn't sign up for, maybe it's time to pick a different path. Learn a new job starting from $200 a month and click on the link in the description or scan the QR code for a free career consultation. Right, let's get back to saving our hero. Using a tourniquet to treat a venomous snake bite is an out-of-date bad idea. In fact, John Hopkins goes as far as saying that this approach actually worsens your outcome and makes it more likely that you could lose your leg. If it did prevent the toxin from moving around your body, the very same toxin would be confined to a smaller volume, meaning it would also be more highly concentrated. Furthermore, cutting off the blood supply means cutting off the supply of oxygen and nutrients to the healthy surrounding tissue, a surefire way to cause further damage. This can, as the Hopkins quote suggests, lead to necrosis and potentially amputation. While we're on the topic of amputation, could severing the part that's received the nasty snake bite be a sacrifice worth making? Severance stops the spread. You might think that losing the offending limb or digit is a reasonable price to pay to save your life, and you're not the only one. It's a fairly well-established trope, and there are multiple published accounts of people doing just this. The conclusion, though, is always the same. They absolutely shouldn't have. 
Snake venom spreads fairly rapidly via the lymphatic system, and this course of action means you've got both a snake bite and an incredibly painful open wound to contend with, increasing your odds of dying from blood loss, infection, or even shock. This is probably as good a segue as we're going to get, so let's have a look at one more dubious treatment for a venomous snake bite. An electric shock neutralizes the venom. About four decades ago, an American missionary physician named Dr. Ron Guderian, working in the rainforest in Ecuador, claimed he had cured several snake bite victims by administering low voltage electric shocks to the wound site within half an hour of the bite incident. He apparently developed this treatment after reading a local newspaper article about a farmer in Illinois who claimed to use electric shocks to alleviate bee stings. While there are currently products on the market that may, for example, relieve the itchiness of a mosquito bite via a very low voltage zap, this is clearly a wildly different scenario to being bitten by a venomous snake. Either way, after finding that all 34 cases of snake bite victims he treated this way ended up surviving, Guderian sent an account of his approach to the highly influential medical journal The Lancet, and ultimately the idea was disseminated further via an article published in the New York Times and Time magazine in 1986. Obviously this doesn't sound like a very plausible medical intervention. By what mechanism could an electric shock neutralize a snake bite? Scientists at the time asked the same question. In the New York Times article, a tropical disease expert explained that It is not a simple toxic effect, and it is hard to understand how something like electricity can have an effect on such a wide range of processes. It just doesn't make sense right now. Ultimately, no evidence that this procedure is actually effective has ever emerged. So how come the patients treated survived? Firstly, there is no record of which snakes the patients were bitten by. Many non-venomous snakes will bite in self-defense. Although painful, bites from such snakes are more or less harmless, especially if they're kept clean. Second, even venomous snakes can deliver dry bites, meaning no venom is actually delivered into the wound. A report on the whole affair published by the Arizona Poison Center notes that they never acknowledged that half the bites in this region were typically dry bites, and a formal study was not conducted. Unfortunately, the lack of either a scientific explanation or an evidence base didn't prevent this idea from spreading, with pilots, missionaries, and mining company employees carrying stun guns into the jungle. By 1990, an estimated 7,000 modified stun guns had been sold for this purpose, and in the same year, an account was published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, describing an American patient who had deliberately electrocuted himself using a car battery, after being bitten on the face by his pet rattlesnake. Long story short, it didn't help. In April of 1990, the US Food and Drug Administration actually banned the advertising of stun guns for treating venomous bites and stings. As far as the science is concerned, a meta-study published in the Journal of Wilderness Medical Society in 2001 put the final nail in the coffin of this idea. The use of stun guns or other sources of high voltage, low amperage direct current electric shocks to treat venomous bites and stings is not supported by the scientific literature. Despite this idea being thoroughly debunked, it seems to be a persistent myth that simply won't die, with medical reviews and authorities still having to advise against this method today. So at this stage we've got a decent idea of what not to do. So what's the move? It's actually more of a non-move. You should keep the affected body part as still as possible and get others to make moves on your behalf. Keep the bite area lower than your heart. In this case, you're better off sat upright on a chair with your foot on the floor. There's a good chance the bite incident itself will be a bit of a blur. So as soon as possible, tell a member of your party what type of snake it was if you know, or if not, have them note down its size, color, 
patterning, and any other information that might help someone to identify it. Get one of your party to call emergency services from the camp, and tell them you've been bitten by a snake. Next, ask for some help to clean the bite with soap and water, and draw a circle around the affected area, making a note of the time. After more time has passed, redraw the boundary and note down the time again. This will give the medics some idea of how quickly it's spreading. Remove any restrictive items of clothing, jewelry, etc. There's a decent chance you're going to experience some swelling. And as we've seen, restricting blood flow is something we definitely want to avoid. Don't apply ice to the swelling though. Let the body do its thing unencumbered. Finally, ask one of your party to keep an eye on your breathing and pulse rate. All of this is important information for the medics. After what seems like an eternity, the chopper arrives, and finally, you're in the safest of safe hands. Exciting as the prospect of a helicopter ride is, this is the type you really, really don't want to take if you can avoid it. And for heaven's sake, watch where you tread. Snakes generally avoid human contact wherever possible, and will only really attempt to strike in self-defense. If you stumble upon one, never attempt to kill it. Instead, calmly back away and leave it in peace. Should you unexpectedly find yourself in very close proximity to a snake that already appears agitated and is adopting a defensive or striking posture, it is best to freeze and stand very still until the snake has stopped posturing and has moved off. In short, if you happen upon a snake in the jungle, treat it with the respect it deserves, and there's every chance you'll both live to see another day. Thanks for watching, stay curious but safe, and please remember to check out our sponsor, Triple Ten. We'll see you next time.